So I was going to tell you I'm from Nebraska. And have you ever been to Nebraska? Okay. Be beyond Omaha? Okay. I grew, up, I grew up 200 miles. I used to say I was from rural Nebraska. Then I realized that's a redundancy. Uh, I grew up in western Nebraska. We have a lot of elbow room, <laughs> a lot of uh, room, and it's uh, a combination of being used to kind of like to moving around and not heeding my mother's admonition to stand still when I was young. So I'll be moving around a little bit uh, during this presentation, but I'll do my best to keep the mic in front of my face. So pleasure and honor to be asked uh, to give this presentation. And what I'd like to do, uh, how have I found God working in my life? I'd like to to draw upon two kind of related themes and within each theme illustrate with uh, uh, two anecdotes. Um, the first theme, and I hope this is of some relevance to you at this point in your life, I, I want to share with you how I learned discernment and how God, at least in my life, I've learned how to uh, trust something within me as God's spirit prompting me to go in a certain direction. So when I was a high school kid growing up in Holders, Nebraska, I was a pretty good athlete. If you'd asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I would have said a St. Louis Cardinal. I, I was a pretty good baseball player. If you ever get to Phelps County, Nebraska, you'll find me the Sports Hall of Fame. Now, that's not a great distinction, but I did put it first on my CV once I got uh, inducted. Uh, it's better than the books. But uh, uh, I was a pretty good player. I realized as I got my senior year, I said I was a pretty good baseball player in Little Town, Nebraska, but it's a small pond and there's a big sea with a lot of good baseball players. So instead of becoming a Cardinal, I thought about becoming a Padre. Okay, thank you. I, I, just, I know it's a bad joke, but uh, uh, San Diego Padres, another baseball team. Um, no, I wasn't sure what to do. And when it came time to go to college, I took kind of a, a path of least resistance. Um, I applied to uh, a number of schools, including two Jesuit schools. I had never met a Jesuit at that point in my life. But I ended up going to the University of Nebraska in Lincoln my freshman year of college, 1981. And I went primarily, I had a uh, basically a full ride academically and my parents were paying for four kids going through school and I was number three. I thought it would help them. Um, I had a brother who was going to school there. I had a number of friends. I loved the sports scene. It was a path, it was far enough away from home to feel like I was getting away from home, but also close enough to get back if I got homesick or needed to have my laundry done better than I was doing on my own. So I went to Nebraska and I was a math major. And I was always good at math, I liked math. Um, and I liked very much my experience at, at Lincoln. I was able to kind of spread my wings a little bit, um, get a little more independence, made a lot of friends, uh, I also started going to Mass regularly at the Newman Center and doing some volunteer work. And the course of the school year, I have a couple distinct memories, one of which I was sharing with uh, Karen's daughter Rose. I, I remember walking through the campus and thinking, what will I do as a math major? And you know, I knew there are possibilities, statistician uh, um, can be... Uh, there's a word I'm not coming up with. Uh, what are the, you call the people who actuary, actuarial sciences? Uh, but I thought, boy, this doesn't really seem life inviting to me. And boy, that walk uh, made an impression on me. And then I realized one night as I was going to bed, because the guys in the dorm would ask me, Where are you, what are you doing? I'd be leaving for 10 o'clock Mass at night. I said, I'm going to Mass. And they said, why? It's Tuesday, or why? It's Thursday. Why are you going to you go to church on Sundays? But it, it had some meaning for me. Now, I thought a little bit about being a priest as a kid growing up in Western Nebraska. I knew one priest the first 18 years of my life. We had the same priest. The next priest was 40 miles away. 
on Father Howe, was a good priest. I served as a mass server. And my knowledge of priesthood was basically small town parish ministry. Um, but there was something going on. And at one point, uh, I was telling a few people that I was thinking, doing maybe going to the seminary, joining the, the, the chaplain of the Newman Center was also the vocations director of the diocese, which is a pretty shrewd uh, conf uh, configuration of positions. And I talked to him about this. He said, oh, of course, you've got to go to the seminary. And I said, well, I don't know if, of course. Um, and I remember talking to a few people, including my brother Mark, with whom I'm very close. And he said, Tom, uh, in my family, Catholicism is very important. We have a couple of religious in the family. I have some great aunts who are uh, sisters. And uh, priests and religious were very much valued. Um, and I was encouraged, but not pushed into this. And my brother said, Tom, I think it's great you want to be a priest, but you're, you're too young to make that decision right now. You, you need a degree anyway. Stay here, get your degree, do some dating, get some experience. He was giving me some pretty good advice, and I got similar advice from others. And I remember one day in April, I took a piece of paper. This is where I, realized, I later realized I was doing Ignatian discernment before I knew what, who St. Ignatius was. I took a piece of paper and drew a line right down the middle. And the left-hand column was reasons to stay at Lincoln as a student. And I had a long list. I liked what I was studying. I liked my friends. I liked, those were the days when Big Red was actually a force in football. And uh, uh, it's just I, I enjoyed the experience very much. Reason to leave. Reasons to leave on the right side. I put down one reason. And I kid you not, two words. Gut feeling, gut feeling. It's kind of hard to explain, but something deep within was gnawing at me that this was the right thing to do. Now, I do teach New Testament, and the language of the New Testament is Greek. And there's a great word in Greek. It's my favorite word, splankna, or the verb is splanknitsomai. And it refers to that deep, inner core of our being, the visceral part of us from which we get our strongest emotions. And it's really that part of us that is most true uh, to ourselves if we, if we listen to it. And I, I learned that I was listening to Splankna. I, I uh, left Lincoln and was sent to a, a seminary in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I'd ha I never looked back. It was great, except three years later sort of having similar dynamics. I was finishing the philosophy training that one has to have before going to theology studies. And I liked my classmates. I was kind of being recognized as somebody who had leadership potential. I was getting all sorts of affirmation. And the city of Philadelphia opened my eyes to a lot of things. Uh, first of all, to cheese steaks and tasty cakes and soft pretzels with mustard. And uh, I learned you can only criticize or make fun of the Phillies or Eagles if you're a Philadelphian. And if you're an outsider, don't dare do it. Learned a, <laughs> learned a lot of lessons. Uh, but the city opened up my life, eyes to a lot of things, particularly what it would mean to be a minister in a church. One year I was sent to uh, teach catechism in North Philly, at a uh, mostly a Puerto Rican uh, Caribbean parish, so a lot of Spanish speaking. I was starting to learn Spanish, poor part of town. Um, and my last year, I was sent to West Philly, St. Carthage Parish, which is a predominantly black neighborhood. And I'm going to share with you just a little story I'll never forget. It was in May of uh, 1985. I was at the parish. And something funny that happened that earlier in the morning, I was telling these uh, little kids what I was. I said, I, I, uh, I go to the seminary. Does anyone know what a seminary is? This little girl immediately raised her hand. She said, yes, that's where they bury dead people. And I said, <laughs> I said, you're not far from the truth. I said, a cemetery, that's a cemetery. I'm in a seminary. Uh, but something about three hours later, not so funny, I was having lunch with the pastor and... This, the principal came in, 
And she said, Father, we called the kids off the playground. There's snipers on the roof across the street. And I remember thinking, boy, in Holdridge, Nebraska, we didn't have snipers across the, on the roof across the street in the playground. Um, what was going on was there was a black separate or liberation group called MOVE, M-O-V-E. And there, the next day, there's a confrontation. It was a terrible disaster. The police dropped an implosion bomb. I don't know if you know Philly, a lot of row homes. And it, it set a whole block on fire. Uh, a lot of deaths, and it was a tragic, tragic incident. Um, and, and, and those kind of things, that was a dramatic instance, but those kind of experiences opened my eyes to there's a much bigger world than Western Nebraska. There's all sorts of need for the good news of the gospel. Um, and in the meantime, I'd also met Jesuits who were down the street at St. Joe's. And I was impressed by them, and uh, the intellectual apostolate was very appealing to me. So I was wondering if I was in the right place. I remember at Lincoln, it was the same question. Am I where I'm supposed to be? I'm not sure. I did the same thing. I drew, took that piece of paper. And all sorts of reasons to stay. I had a few reasons for leaving. Uh, one was the more I learned about the Jesuits, the more I was attracted to them. Although my Jesuit spiritual director, like my brother uh, three years earlier, discouraged me from doing what I wanted to do. I think partly he did because he thought there might be a conflict of interest. He might look bad being my spiritual director. All of a sudden, I joined the Jesuits. Uh, he, he thought he, he might be poaching. Um, so I did the same thing. But the biggest reason I put down was gut feeling. And I joined the Jesuits, and I've, I've never looked back. And what, what I want to share with you about that is, you know what, uh, I'm sure as you discern your future, think about your future. There's all sorts of voices, there's all sorts of good things one can do in, in one's life, right? Um, and what I learned, and I believe is God training me, God helping me to understand how God was calling me, was to trust that deep down voice within, which is that part of us that I think is open to God. Um, there's going to be a lot of well-intentioned people giving you very good advice. But ultimately, your life and your future is yours. And I don't mean that in a selfish sense. But uh, I think we all know Father Himes' uh, three questions. And my version of that is that deep down gut feeling that is going to lead you to be your truest self. And if it is your truest self, and if it's from God, it's going to help others, right? Because Father Himes asked not only what you take joy in, what are you good at, but what does the world need of you, right? And this is kind of my version uh, of that. Um, and I've, since then, uh, you know, is my position as dean, I don't have to make all these kind of decisions, but I've learned to trust that. And what I want to share with you is that's also the fruit of some prayer and reflection. You know, I think, what's going on there? I think, is that, what, whose voice is that? Because there's all sorts of voices within us, right? <laughs> um, but to learn and, uh, and to grow in the practice of reflecting and learning from your experiences, but trusting, uh, trust yourself. And I really do encourage you to look forward. I, I don't mean this in a selfish sense, but it's your life, your vocation, and people can help you. You should reach out, but trust yourself, okay, and grow in that. Now, another way God has worked in my life is uh, to be with me in very powerful ways in difficult times. So I joined the Jesuits in 1985, 22. In spring of 87, so I was in the novitiate still, I was with another novice. We were, uh, the novices were sent, we were in St. Paul, Minnesota, the novitiate, and our novice director dropped us outside of the city, and we were each given $25 at a destination and said, see you in six weeks. And uh, I don't advocate 
doing this, but basically we, we hitchhiked and got to our destination. I was with, set with another novice. And during the course of that pilgrimage, and we spent a lot of time waiting for rides and whatnot, I passed out a couple times. I'd get dizzy and I would pass out. And it kind of freaked him out. I can understand why, the guy you're with and you're far away from home. And I said to him, Tom, don't worry. It happens all the time. Now, in retrospect, that wasn't really comforting to me that I was trying to. So he told the novice director when we got back, and the first time I experienced the command of obedience, my novice director said, you get to some doctoring. And this is going to sound so ancient to you. 1987, I, I was uh, in Milwaukee at the time. I was in another assignment. And I had a CAT scan. And there was something that emerged in the base of my brain stem. And they told me, we have a new technology, 1987, magnetic resonance imaging. <laughs> now here's the one such machine in the city of Milwaukee. One other such machine, the whole state of Wisconsin, the, the Milwaukee machine was booked for four, week, four months. So I went to Madison. And the, Wisconsin has more than two MRI machines now. <laughs> uh, and I'll never forget seeing the image. And I had a, uh, a tumor at the base of my brain stem. Now, I was 22 years old. And by that time, I was tw yeah, I was 24 at that time. That's something I'll never forget sitting with a doctor and hearing those words. You, you don't expect to hear that. And we're talking about what could be done. I was suffering hearing loss. Uh, I didn't have all the movement in my face, and it was causing the dizziness. So uh, the short of it is, I ended up having a 10-hour operation. And when I came out of that operation, and they told me this would be the case, I, uh, it looked like I had a stroke. I had no control of the right, left side of my face. And uh, they sent me home, uh, the Jesuits sent me home to be with my parents and make sure I was well fed and whatnot. And I remember looking in the mirror. I used to wear contact lenses. I couldn't blink my eye to wet the, the contacts. And I remember looking in that mirror every day, wondering if I would ever uh, be able to move the face and wondering, what's, what's my life going to be? And it was an interesting experience of how much you know, we put stock in our appearance, right? And it was a, it was a spiritual experience. But, um, but through this all, the whole surgery and recovery, I had so many people praying for me, and I had a real sense that th this was going to be OK. God had led me this far, and I didn't think he led me this far just to have it end this way. Um, and sure enough, um, things got a lot better. I was uh, so only left with deafness in my left ear. Um, grateful for the great care I got. I share that because two summers ago, I was here in Boston. I was uh, working on a book. I'd gone out running that, uh, on a Saturday morning in July. And I came back, and I just didn't feel right. And a couple of people looked at me and said, you don't look yourself. And I said, well, what does that mean? And I was, I was pale. And, um, and I did something, and I think it was my guardian angel or God tapped me on the shoulder. I'm not a, somebody who immediately goes to the doctor. Um, but I said, I think I need to go. And the day I went, I started noticing when I got up from my chair, I had a throbbing pain on my right temple. And I went to a doctor. And the surgeon, when I told the surgeon the story, he says, your doctor saved your life. How, she, why she did what she did. I'm, she felt my temple. She said, I don't like what I feel. I want you to go to, say, to the uh, emergency room. And I was dressed up, you know, co coat and dress shirt. I said, Dr. Cream, OK, I go to the emergency. What do I say? Or what do, you give me something to show them. Because so, I've been in the emergency room. I'm, I was a little brother, younger brother, and my older brothers are bigger than I am. 
and I was in the emergency room a number of times as a kid, cuts, broken bones. You know, you usually go to the emergency room, you think, I associate blood or something obvious wrong. <laughs> Please help me. Here, I was looking like this. She wrote out something, and uh, the short of it is, um, they showed me the CAT scan, and there's a lot of stuff going on in the brain. Boston has plenty of MRIs, and the MRI, and I found a brain tumor at the base, or at my uh, right fr frontal lobe. And thanks to the world benefactor at Boston College, uh, a guy named Jack Connors, I got whisked into Brigham and Women's at the best surgical team. And so I had this uh, surgery, and I remember meeting the surgeon who, uh, who knew I was a professor and priest and that I taught scripture. And his father was a minister, and we kind of hit it off. And then he told me he's from Chicago. And I said, ooh, do you like the Bears? And uh, he said, yeah. And I said, well, I'm a Packer guy. I said, that's, you're not going to hold that. That's not going to influence your way of surgery. He said, no, no. But that son of a gun, he left me a scar that looks like the C on the Chicago uh, helmet. But that's, uh, I made that as an observation, not a criticism. Um, and I told him something. I said, you know, Doc, I know I've, I'm going to have this serious surgery. I said, I've already had a neurosurgery. I know what it's like to wake up in intensive care, stuff hooked up to stuff you wish you weren't hooked up to, and feeling like somebody just cut your skull because, in fact, they had. He kind of looked at me like this, but I felt uh, this very odd sense of calm. Um, a Jesuit once told me, Tom, Boston is a great city to get sick in. And he's absolutely right. The resources here are tremendous. Had surgery, went for the biopsy, and the, uh, the surgeon asked a curious question. He said, in the Catholic Church, how do people become saints, how does that work? He said, I had no idea, why are we talking about saints? Well, it dawned on me about three minutes later what he's talking about, he said, we need a miracle. And we need to pray to a saint, somebody to have a miracle. So we're praying to a judge. Has anyone ever heard of Walter Chiswick? Father Walter Chiswick, a great, if you ever want a great read, uh, there's a book he wrote called With God in Russia. Uh, it was an American Jesuit who got, it was doing clandestine ministry in the Soviet Union uh, in the aftermath of World War II and was arrested as a Soviet spy and spent many years in solitary and in the gulags. Um, survived all that. He wrote about his experience. It's a beautiful story. Not, never, but he always found God's will in the midst of that. So we're praying to Father Walter for a miracle because uh, the cancer I have, it was a cancerous tumor, uh, it was a glioblastoma. Uh, he, I think you know President Biden had a son who died, Bo Biden, that's what he died of. Um, those of you who may have known Joy Moore, one of our VPs, her husband just died of one of these. It's a serious condition. Uh, the median length of survival from a first diagnosis, so the, uh, half the people get this far, half the people get beyond it. It's 14 months. Uh, mine was 26 months ago. 5% make it to five years. So it's a serious, serious condition. So why am I telling you about this? Well, in the midst of all this, first of all, I've had a similar experience as I had my first major surgery. A lot of people praying for me, supporting me, and experiencing God's love through that. But even more, a sense of God being with me I, uh, and strengthening me and give me the graces that I need. Uh, the, anyone in the business school? Here? Okay. Uh, your dean, Andy Boynton, and I have become pretty good friends. And he asked me an interesting question one time he, uh, after the surgery. We had just gone out to eat a couple nights before, and he was kind of shaken by the whole thing. He said, Tom, what's it like when you're alone? And it was a good question. I do spend time alone with it because I spend time praying. 
And what I find myself experiencing actually is more and more gratitude because life itself is a gift. And the fact that I'm able to function and do my job as dean uh, keeps me kind of outward focused. But where do I get all this? It's, I, I'm convinced God has given me the grace. And I'm going to close with this, and I don't want to get too pious, but how do I feel God at work in me in this and how he's calling me to be? Um, I've undergone two rounds of radiation, so I've spent, if you add it all up, nine weeks you know, every day, radiation table. And they put this mask on me that's a kind of a combination of Freddy Krueger and a hockey goalie mask. Uh, but <laughs> they strap it down so I don't move. And I've also spent a lot of time in MRI machines. And when I go in the MRIs, uh, it's like going into a tomb. And I don't want to get too macabre, but what I pray about is, um, Lord, what do you want of me? And I, the, there's a couple passages I think about in the scripture, Bartimaeus, blind Bartimaeus. Jesus asks him, what do you want me to do? And Bartimaeus says, I want to see. And I imagine Jesus asking me, why do I want? I said, Lord, I want to be cancer free if it be your will. Um, but what I find myself called and wanting to do is to be a faithful witness to three things in my life. Faithful witness to Jesus' self-giving love, his incarnational self-giving love. I want to somehow embody that as best I can because I've experienced that love myself, both my own prayer life and the circumstances that God's blessed me with a wonderful family, wonderful vocation, wonderful people at, uh, with whom to work here at Boston College, including Karen, uh, wonderful folks at STM. Um, I've got a lot to be grateful. I want to uh, live out of that love. Secondly, I want to bear witness to what Pope Francis says is the joy of the gospel. I think we bear witness to our faith, not by a fake joy, but by focusing on the positive and the good things. Um, and thirdly, I want to bear faithful witness to our hope in the resurrection from the dead. I, I will be the first to admit I have found our faith so consoling to me because I've said this to a number of people. If we didn't believe in the resurrection of Jesus and what we believe in the creed, this would be a tragedy. You know, here I am kind of in my prime, and who knows how much longer I got. Um, but we believe that death is not the end but the beginning. And while I'm not thrilled about this, uh, as a priest, as uh, somebody who teaches New Testament, I'm, we, the, the resurrection is the fundamental tenet and belief. It's the reason for all this. And I want to bear faithful witness to it in my life, not just my words. And how to, you know, I, I'm saying this with all sincerity, I'm actually happy to have this opportunity. And that, I think, is God working within me.